there's going to be a real logistical problem and a capacity problem in terms of getting the food aid into all those people in time. The numbers involved in Ethiopia are huge and challenging enough on their own. Yet, at the same time, famine relief is already being delivered to 14 million people in southern Africa. The countries there include Malawi, Zimbabwe and Zambia. By next March or April, the agencies could be dealing with a famine that affects 28 million people, perhaps more. It's a human catastrophe, but will demand a logistical response on a scale that may prove simply too big. Everything now depends on the rains. Richard Wilson, BBC News, Ethiopia. Teenagers who smoke cannabis run an increased risk of depression and schizophrenia in later life, according to new research carried out in Britain. Three separate studies published in the British Medical Journal suggest that weekly users of the drug are twice as likely to suffer. Daily users run five times the risk. John Kay has been looking at the latest evidence. D has been using cannabis since he was a teenager, smoking up to ten joints every day. He's certain it hasn't caused him any mental problems. I have no experience in my 30 years of being among smokers of anyone getting more depressed or schizophrenic because of cannabis. Their life circumstances can lead them down and down and down. And in that case, they often blame all of the so-called drugs that they're taking as the cause of it. But in fact, these are factory people anyway. But three reports out today suggest he's wrong. Instead of depicting cannabis as a relaxing and almost harmless drug, the research claims users are far more likely to suffer from depression or schizophrenia. The most vulnerable people, the very young and those who may have early signs of mental illness, are the most at risk from taking cannabis. Unfortunately, these are the ones who actually use it. This research suggests the more cannabis you smoke when you're younger, the more likely you are to suffer mental health problems later in life. So does that put students here at Bristol University off using the drug? I don't think it's going to change anyone's minds. I mean, look at cigarettes. Everyone smokes cigarettes. It, everyone knows it. It will kill you later. But people just shrug their shoulders like they do with everything. You get these scientists one week saying that it's good for you, that it's good for some things, and then, well, this week apparently it's very bad for you. This man wants to legalise cannabis. He says today's study proves the drug should be licensed and brought under state control. And for people who don't know what they're doing and are ignorant of the effects, it can have a dramatic effect on them. That is a minority group of people and they need to be informed. We all need to be informed. Tonight, mental health charities are calling for more research. They want to know if cannabis really causes these conditions or if the mentally ill are just more likely to use the drug in the first place. John Kay, BBC News, Bristol. Argentina's government is expected to lift restrictions on people withdrawing money from their bank accounts on Monday. The limits were imposed almost a year ago to prevent a banking collapse when the country's economic crisis began. Despite a gradual return of confidence in the banks, the poorest quarters of the population continue to suffer extreme hardships. The pitiful face of poverty in Argentina. The country's hardship is taking itself out on the poorest, the weakest. This is the hospital in Tucumán, one of the areas hardest hit. Ten children died here recently because the country is too poor to feed them. This girl is nine years old. Her body is weak as a 90-year-old's. There are children like these in hospitals scattered across the country. In some areas, more than half the children are malnourished. The government is not blind to their suffering. On Friday, President Dualde announced Operation Rescue, a kind of early warning system in communities to guarantee help to families in need. The president's wife herself will run the scheme. Here she tells people to organise warnings of malnutrition cases so they can get help in time. But they can't give what they don't have and help has to come from outside. A late shipment of donations from the United States is finally unloaded, but the pans and cans are in poor condition, dirty and out of date. President Dualde is looking for the International Monetary Fund to commit aid on a much bigger scale. Unfreezing bank accounts on Monday is one of the steps to getting that aid. Four years of recession have left an economic nightmare here that's becoming a human disaster. It will take time to save Argentina's economy. Looking at these faces, it's clear there may not be quite so much time to save some of Argentina's children. Gillian Nichali, BBC News. 
As Austrians prepare for elections on Sunday, the latest polls are showing the tightest of races with the Conservatives running neck and neck with the Social Democrats. These elections were called after Austria's coalition government collapsed two months ago. One thing does seem certain though, the far-right Freedom Party of Jörg Haider is likely to suffer. From Vienna, here's the BBC's Tristana Moore. <laughs> Back in the front line, Jörg Haider, slick and suntanned. You'd never guess looking at him that his far-right Freedom Party has plummeted in the opinion polls. At a rally in Upper Austria, Haider was doing what he does best, working the crowd. Though he's not the leader of the Freedom Party, it was thanks to him that the last government collapsed. Jörg Haider is banking on his personal appeal to help him win votes for his party. But given the fact the Freedom Party has lost so much support recently, that may be a bit too late. We caught up with Haider on the campaign trail. Is it your fault, though, that your party has lost so much support? Oh, our party will win a lot of support, and you will see in the result on Sunday. But you used to have 30% of the opinion polls. You now only have 10%. Yeah, maybe. We have uh, had 30% uh, in the opinion polls, but the result lower. Now we have uh, low opinion polling and we will have a good result. Not if this man has anything to do with it. Chancellor Wolfgang Schussel, who's desperate to avoid joining the Freedom Party in another coalition government. The Conservatives are hoping that by shifting to the right, there'll be no room for Haider in Austrian politics. In many respects, the Conservative Party adopted politics from Haider's or Haider's ideas. One of the emotional issues being immigration, and in that respect, there is almost no difference or no difference at all between the Conservative Party and Haider's party. The big room. These asylum seekers have first-hand experience of the Conservatives' tough new stance on immigration. Many were thrown out of a state-run refuge home and are now staying at this hostel in Vienna. Douglas Gideon is from Liberia. He told us he's had no support from the government. I beg the government to really try and do something for the immigrants because uh, it's not really easy for us to survive without their support. I think that some people in the Conservative Party thought they would get some votes by dealing with asylum seekers like they do to become more strict. Many Austrian voters are now turning to the Conservatives, disillusioned with the Freedom Party's failure to deliver during their spell in government. But Jörg Haider is by no means on his way out. He said he may return as leader if his party does badly in this weekend's election. Tristana Moore, BBC News, Vienna. This is BBC News. Hello there. It's not only us that's seen wet and windy weather during the month of November. We've also seen it in central parts of Europe. Croatia seeing over an inch of rain in just six hours, giving some flooding there. And we continue to see some flooding in the Alps, where Locarno already has seen some very wet weather during the month, has seen close to 100 millimetres in just two days. Now, during today, we'll see further sharp showers across the Alps. And we can see very unsettled weather across France and Iberia, sunshine and showers or longer spells of rain. That will continue into Sunday, particularly wet across northern Spain into southern France, up into the west and the north too. And we could see some flooding in these areas as well. Now, not surprisingly, it's all due to areas of low pressure. They'd be continuing to pile in from the Atlantic, bringing their cloud and heavy rain. Also some strong winds at times, and we will also see some quite mild weather as well. So it's not particularly good news for Aberdeen, where already they've had their wettest October on record. November, they've seen double their average so far. And as we can see from the satellite picture, we've got more heavy rain, not only for Aberdeen, but for many parts of the country as we go through the weekend and into next week as well. So the winds are always going to be coming from a mild direction from the south or southwest, easing at times during Sunday and Monday. But then they pick up in force again as we go into Tuesday and Wednesday. They'll be moisture laden, promising further wet spells of weather. 
but the one saving grace is it's going to be quite mild these are temperatures by day and we can see as we head into next week temperatures rise above 10 degrees across many parts of the country and for most of us it is going to be frost free as well certainly that's true tonight inland we'll see temperatures down to around five or six and this is where it's likely to be dry by the end of the night elsewhere we'll see showers mainly confined to coasts but by morning we'll start to see a spell of wetter weather coming into the south some heavy thundery downpours around and after a brighter start further north over england and wales just a few showers we'll see that wetter weather coming in from the south but for many parts of northern ireland and scotland it will be brighter with some sunshine around but we will see a few showers and still wet and windy across northeastern parts of scotland feeling quite cool here despite temperatures of nine or ten elsewhere temperatures very similar to the last few days but feeling cool in those brisk winds and those hefty downpours certainly at ascot light yesterday will be affected by those showers but temperatures up to around 12 degrees and for the games at aston villa and fulham we're likely to see some showers but everton could escape with a dry match against west brom likewise in scotland for the kilmarnock and partick games hibs though likely to catch a few showers as well and a rather unsettled look for the rugby union matches during this afternoon too for Sunday, it's a bit of a east-west split, dry and brighter in the east with some sunshine. Most of the showers out to the west and the north, temperatures very similar to what we'll see today. And for the game against Scotland versus Fiji at Murrayfield, hopefully it'll be dry and bright with some sunshine. Now Monday, many places seeing a dry day with some bright weather, with some sunshine, but some low cloud coming in towards the east coast. And overnight on Monday, we'll see a wet spell of weather. That will be moving northwards over England and Wales on Tuesday. Elsewhere, a brighter slice and rain in the far north. Now I'll leave you with a summary. So you got here then. The response is expected in the next hour from the White House following the latest UN resolution. Phil, order changes. Your eyes are on Washington to see the action. We have guest reaction to UN. What's the guest name? Stand by camera two next. What's his name? What's his name? UN policy in the Middle East. Phil, his name is Dr. Hussein Hamid. Dr. Hamid, thank you for joining us. BBC News 24 presenters, your calm at the heart of the story. The Chief of Staff ordered evacuation. The Secretary of Defense suggested retaliation. His economic advisor warned that a war will tarnish the economy. The Vice President talked of a setback to the peace process. But he kept thinking about the next election. 17 minutes after the attack, the U.S. President made his decision. With only hours to decide, how does the world's greatest super power respond to an international crisis. BBC4 brings you real-time drama from the heart of the West Wing, Monday at 9 and Wednesday at 10.50. This is BBC News 24. I'm Martine Croxall. In a moment, straight talk, but first at 4.30, a summary of the main news stories. The head of the TUC, John Monks, has urged other Trians to back the firefighters in their pay dispute. He accused the government of provoking the current eight-day walkout by blocking a possible deal, a claim angrily denied by the Deputy Prime Minister, John Prescott. Mr Monks' intervention comes after the Fire Brigades Union accused the government of engaging in reckless and irresponsible behaviour. But the government maintains the deal would have been flawed because it was uncosted and made little reference to changes in working practices. The BBC's political editor, Andrew Marr, says the government sees its reputation for economic management hanging on the outcome of the strike. Consequently, Downing Street is determined to stand firm in order to prevent demands for big wage increases across the public sector. I think that everybody in the public services, all the other unions, would look at Andy Gilchrist and say, well, he did it for his boys, we want the same or something similar. And the government would suddenly be faced by a wave of very, very high new pay claims, which the Treasury has been busily costing today. Um, many, many billion pounds it would cost them. The Iron Chancellor would be the Play-Doh Chancellor. The city would be irate. The opposition would be derisive. Um, and suddenly, ministers look at all of this and say, this could be the moment, this fire dispute, that we suddenly blow the lot. It could be the beginning of the unravelling of our entire reputation for economic competence. That is why there is a note of something close to hysteria in Downing Street over this. 
A man has died in a house fire in Maidstone in Kent during the first night of the strike. Two green goddesses were sent to the scene and the local fire station also sent crews. Earlier, six soldiers were injured while trying to tackle a fire at a disused factory in West Bromwich in the West Midlands. Initially, regular firefighters did leave their picket line but returned to their station when it became clear no lives were at risk. London is to host next month's Miss World contest because of the violent demonstrations in Nigeria, which have left more than 100 people dead. An article by a Nigerian newspaper provoked a wave of protest by Muslims by suggesting that the Prophet Muhammad would have married a Miss World contestant had he been alive today. A number of contestants had already announced they were withdrawing over fears for their safety. Organisers say the decision to pull out was taken in the interests of both Nigeria and those taking part. The United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan has said that he's disturbed by the death of a British UN worker who was shot during an Israeli raid on the Janine refugee camp in the West Bank. Mr Annan said the Israeli army had delayed letting in an ambulance to take Ian Hook, who was 54, to hospital. The army said an ambulance reached Mr Hook as soon as possible. An Irish pro-Palestinian activist was injured in the raid. She was shot in the foot. Thousands of demonstrators will gather in central London today to protest against plans for airport expansion. Groups of local campaigners from Kent, Heathrow, Luton, Rugby and Stansted have joined forces to stage the protest. They say if enforced, the plans will blight their communities and cause environmental damage. That's the summary. I'll be back at five with a full bulletin of international news. Now on BBC News 24, it's time for Straight Talk, a look at the week's political events with our chief political correspondent, Gita Harry. And welcome to Straight Talk. We're told it's not inevitable and yet we're planning for war. The United States has now made a formal request for troops 